Hi, Nadav. Welcome to New York. Thank you. Nice to be here. And yeah. How long have you been here? A couple of days? No, I've been on a lovely road trip with my um, 24 year old daughter right through Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee. And then I went to see my mother. Really, really lucky girl. Yeah, it's been uh, a country music uh, 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 exploration and very, very nice to be with her. That's really wonderful to hear. Uh, it's uh, 12 o'clock. I hope I'm not keeping you from a good lunch with Howard Greenberg. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> So um, you have an exhibit at Howard Greenberg's and it's called uh, Thread. The, the thread. thread. Yeah. And in that exhibit, well, that exhibit includes images um, of the Yangtze and Thames series, two rivers with a heavy presence uh, both in the past and in the present. Uh, very important rivers. And also in that same exhibit, you also have portraits. And you said about portraits that they are an important part of your practice. Um, besides, the, besides the rivers and the portraits, is there anything else that I'm not including in the exhibit? Yeah, there's, um, there's a picture from a series that I titled Dust which is um, uh, test sites, nuclear test sites. I found this on the web for in... a series that I have titled Dust Witches. My Check Lord, out. that's Siri speaking. Can you believe it? Um, there's, a series, uh, there's a picture from a series called Dust, which were the uh, um, a set of pictures taken in and around nuclear test sites in Russia mm -hmm. when Russia was catching uh, or trying to emulate the power of the US yeah. um, mm -hmm. after the Second World War. And I visited those test sites. So there's one picture from that. There's also a picture from Color Fields, um, a nighttime picture made in uh, Brazil um, of ocean waves. You mentioned the Thames Estuary, and there's one other picture from the Arctic Circle. Yes, <clears throat> that will be included in what we're presenting of your work. Right, so that's, that's, that's the whole show. And yes, portraits are very important to my practice. Uh, all of my, well, as you so correctly mentioned a few minutes ago, the rivers are very important historically. And it's that historical uh, weight that almost sits on my shoulders while I photograph. Although the Thames Estuary, my local river, as I live in London, and it's made 10 or 12 years after the Yangtze River, or the work is made 10 or 12 years after the Yangtze River project was made, um, it's a much more introspective set of pictures than the Yangtze. I noticed just because, that, I noticed that, yes. Just because I've moved on in my practice, um, I'm far more interested at present in the um, body of work that an artist makes, but the whole body of work. And I'm, I'm not interested as much in photography, holding on to the old fashioned construct of um, the event that occurs in front of the camera, in front of the lens. I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in seeing the hand of the artist, the presence of the artist. So almost like seeing the landscape that's behind the lens. Um, Are you saying you're internalizing uh, what you're seeing and then expressing it? Uh, yeah, well put. I think I spend time, I think I spend time trying to soak the atmosphere and what a certain river means to me and what um, that great history means, the, the painters who painted it, the writers who wrote about it, the, the, the great wars fought on it, the, the toil, the love, the loss, the voyage, all of that that is all about human 
condition, human emotion. And all of my work is about man. Whether I focus my lens on a river and man is not present, man is very much present. So seemingly not present or not physically present. But in, for me, when I look at the work, it couldn't have been made without the presence of man. And so then the portraits become a sort of drilling down. The portraits become, become another way of portraiting man. That's not well put. Let me say that again. The close-in portraits are just another way of making a portrait of man. The landscapes, the riverscapes are also portraits. It's just that the portraits exhibited in the different room at Howard Greenberg are almost a drilling down, a, cr a closer scrutiny of, of a human's face. And it's all internalized through you and then re-expressed through Nadav Kand. Yeah, well, I, um, the, the reason I chose the, the title The Thread comes from a great poem by William Stafford, The Way It Is. Um, and I've always, before I even read the poem, in fact, my wife put the poem in front of me because I spoke of the thread. And let me just pause a minute. Um, I speak of the thread and I speak of the flow. And when I feel like I'm in the flow, my ego is put aside. All I am, all, my work is flowing. I'm in the sweet spot. I am, it's easy, it's, it's, it's soft, and it and it's, has no restriction. And but that's what I... That's when I know that I am making work that matters to me, that will nourish me. And I often have the vision of a thread that lies in my lap. And every new picture I put that has been made while I am in the flow adds to that thread. And the thread is what holds all the work together. And I think, I hope, and I do leave it to the viewer, that when they look at this room, that they get that there's a common feeling amongst the pictures, even though they're taken at disparate places in the world and at disparate times. Well, what I get from what you're saying is that <clears throat> while you work, you actually become the flow itself. You're flowing with what's going on. You're internalizing and you're flowing with it. And, you know, William Stafford is a sort of a spiritual being and uh, so we're entering a different area of thinking and being here am i correct yes you are thank you so your bio says that your work is stamped by a sense of quiet and unease that's your signature and you attribute that to scenes of apartheid that you witnessed in South Africa where you grew up as a kid. And I was thinking that decades have gone by since and you must have processed these early impressions. So what came up for me is that could it be that that sense of quiet and unease is simply a product of your aesthetic that's how you express yourself visually. And that's how you transmute uh, what you have internalized. Well, first of all, I don't, think, I don't think that what I witnessed in growing up in South Africa is the only story um, that makes it up. I think, I think there's cellular memory. I think there are many things that one doesn't understand. All that I do know is that when I imagine myself in a, in a, uh, if I imagine myself in a place of, of absolute tranquility, it's always surrounding water, quiet, softness, slow moving. And it's that kind of work that I enjoy looking at as well, including um, 
Rothko springs to mind, um, um, Motherwell, Newman, um, but then also the work of Boromans and Brachman and Luke Toymans, who are who add that sort of uh, uneasiness. So there's a, it's the mixture, it's the sort of mustard on a chocolate cake that I like. It's the, or not a chocolate cake, but it's that, it's the, it's the um, seeming, seemingly, seemingly beautiful, but with a, with an edge that's uncomfortable that I find um, nourishing to me. It's, that's the work that I like. I certainly don't, um, I discount work that is purely um, aesthetic. And or objective. So your exhibit is inspired by the poem by William Stafford, the way, uh, the way it is. And I think that that poem encourages us to view closely to what is fundamental in us. The last line in the poem says, you don't let go of the thread, as you mentioned. And to me, <clears throat> and I'm comparing notes with you, the thread is what keeps me connected and tethered to the fundamental in me. Does that sound reasonable to you? It does sound reasonable. The thread, the thread for me is what holds the work, the successful work holds the work together. I don't always, I don't always add works to that thread. Sometimes they made and then discounted. But the works that are successful, yes, thicken that thread, make it stronger. So it takes a period of evaluation of the work and you look at it after you've, after you've done it. And uh, you try and sense whether it works with the body of work that matters to you. I think so. I think that's primarily the reason every project has always taken me so long um, to put out, because I need quite long times to look back at the work. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't photograph that much, but I contemplate a lot and I need, I need quite large tracts of time to, to view the work. Um, I'm not always, I'm not always that objective or subjective um, quickly. And how do you know that a new piece of work has found its place in the previous work that you find significant? What tells you that it does? Because after a time of looking at it, the, the initial excitement remains and that I see myself in the work, that I see that it, that it, um, yeah, that I see, I see my hand in it. I see my, I see clear authorship in it, but I can't be too caught up in what I first liked because otherwise it might be a bit like that piece of music you hear that you love, but get sick of. Um, I need to put quite a lot of time into into the, from when I make it to when I am sure it belongs. Yes, I understand that. So your series on the Yangtze River received the prestigious Pipikte Prize in 2009, I believe. And it, that's it, right, yeah. Yeah, and it's a truly prestigious uh, distinction that was bestowed upon your work. Um, I don't think you sub you can submit for it. Someone has to submit uh, your name for the consideration. Is that how it works? That is correct. Yeah, you nominated, and then through a process, you slowly get 
filtered down, yeah. Do you remember who uh, submitted your name? I think I think a couple people had put it for. No, I'm not actually sure. Um, I'm not actually sure. I think for. Um, no, I'm not sure. They don't reveal that to you. Um, it's so long ago. I think I've forgotten if I did know. Um, it had a it had a good show at Flowers Gallery, and then it had a wonderful write up by Francis Hodgkin, um, and I think that's what cemented that it was nominated. But I don't know by who. Mm, that's interesting. You know, they have a lot. They have a lot of nominators. They have a good hundred people that nominate the judging process, which I then was involved in the year after, um, is very. Um, rigorous. Um, I know that most of your Yangtze images have that overcast weather feeling, which mm -hmm. evens out the tonalities and uh, quiets everything down, so to speak. Um, and where the colors hue cold rather than warm. Did you wait for overcast skies or was that the effect of overall pollution? I was curious about that. If you, if you um, ask any Chinese person who lives somewhere near the river, they'll say to you that those pictures are really uh, um, accurate in a way because it, it usually is overcast. I found that most of my travels, and I made five different trips, never staying longer than about two weeks. Um, and every time I found it like that, you know, it's a very industrialized um, river. There's never nature. There's never long tracts of nature along it. I didn't travel every single bit of it, but even when it gets close to Tibet or what was Tibet, um, it, there are still cement factories and pylons, electricity pylons. It's never natural. So I think it's partly pollution, but I also think it's a very cold river that flows very fast through warm areas. And that causes a lot of that cloud cover um, yes. around the Yangtze. So it's really both. Um, it's a combination of both, yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, I enhanced it and, and held it back in my printing process to make to make it a very flowing set of pictures, uh, excuse the pun, to make it a body of work that held together. Remember, I'm not a documentarist. I'm not, uh, I never set out to make documentary pictures. Um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not of the mind that my camera is an accurate, you know, shows an accurate picture of what's in front of it, as I said earlier. And you say that because? I say that because if I change color of the pictures, if I, if I when I print, if I bring pictures together, um, that's, that, that's, that's a plus point for me. The more you can see Nadav Kander in a picture, the happier I am. Yes, that's true. But the lighting is what it is. Well, it's outdoors, so you can't change yeah. it a, a yeah. lot, but you can change color. You can, you know, there's a lot you can do to make a set of pictures a closer, you know, closer relationship. Yeah. The other thing that plays an important role in, in, in your landscapes is uh, scale. And I'm sure you're not surprised by my bringing it up. Uh, the first time I ever saw one of your pictures was, uh, the picture was called the Aral Sea. And that's what I noticed right away, your use of scale in your landscapes. And uh, scale for me means a relative uh, reduced size of the central subject in the overall visual space. And um, I'm sure it was intentional. Or was it? 
it's it's certainly intentional, but I'm not sure that it's that it's cerebral. It's a it's a way that I work. It's it's a way that when I when I key into the proportions that I like, that is when I start to feel the flow. Yes, as you described earlier. So it's not. It's a very in, uh, uh, intuitive sense. There's there's a way that I frame that's that begins the flow. There's a uh, so I can't really put it any better. I know that that is what makes me tick. Um, and then I'm very happy to put it in front of viewers and see how they tick. And it's all about the viewer continuing the story, you know, making their own stories, uh, looking into themselves for answers. I'm not trying to provide them. Yeah, well, it's interesting because often the um, space seems to overtake the central subject like the diminutive man washing his diminutive motorcycle in the waters of the mighty Yangtze River. And scale determines mood and momentum a lot of the time in your images. Uh, yeah, um, you know, well put. I think that, you know, that picture reminds, you know, when I look at that picture and talk about it, when I, um, I often show a slide of Klein, you know, Klein has a big sweeping brush that yes, yes. puts a black line onto a canvas and it's quite a masculine uh, strength to it. And then there's the small person almost, almost diminished by the, the big ideas man has, or in China's case, possibly this emulating the West. Remember that's about 2007. So they feel, I'm very, um, I'm very drawn to constructivist work. I remember seeing a show when I first came to London when I was 22, and I went to the Royal Academy and saw a massive collection called the Kostakis Collection of, of from Malevich to Kandinsky of the most wonderful constructivist abstract work. And I was, it, I felt like I'd come home. I felt like I had always known this work, but never seen it. And that's very present in a picture like the one you mentioned. Yes. Well, the man walking the bike, that's in Chongqing. Yes, and when you said that one way or the other, there is human presence. And when there is human presence, the energy in an image changes instantly, uh, right? It's uh, very striking. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I think in the Thames, there's never physically the human, but the but I but I hope that the presence is felt either through the viewing of it or having read maybe a small amount about it or just yeah. But for me, there's a great human presence there too. It's just not yeah, physically. And it's also what people already know about the Thames that comes into play. Yeah. Correct. I was, I was interested uh, by your statement uh, that photography encapsulates time. You know, Susan Sontag said something interesting uh, in her book on photography. And she said, whereas a mediocre painting <clears throat> loses value over time, the opposite happens to a mediocre photographer because a, photograph a photograph encapsulates time. It encapsulates the state of the whole world in an instant, and that instant is lost to the passage of time. Uh, <clears throat> when you look at, a, at an old photograph, you get a sense not only of what's in the photograph, but how it was then beyond the photograph. And your images do that, and they encapsulate time. They tell they tell us a lot of what's beyond the image. Um, would you say that of the Thames Estuary work? 
The same necessary work, I think, is its own thing, uh, separate from the young <laughs> set. Yeah, no, it is. And because it was made at such a different time, because I would say you quite correct with the Yangtze that it certainly encapsulates a time and there's, it's a bit like Walker Evans when he photographed the little churches or he would specifically include uh, a car because he knew that in some time ahead, one would look back and know it's time because of that. I agree with that, but increasingly I'm getting away from time and place. I'm trying to exclude it and make my work more and more banal so that the viewer is more challenged and more frustrated to find their own answers. Yes. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, I need you to, I need to ask you what you mean <clears throat> when you say that photography encapsulates physical borders when you speak of the thins. We're getting to that now. Um, how does photography encapsulate physical borders? I don't know how I said that. In what context did I say that? I think it was, <clears throat> it was in a conversation, uh, David Company, I think of ICP, I think. And you said, I think it was in that conversation. So it struck me, and I tried to understand um, how it fits with your work. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure I can answer you because I don't know its context and I can't, the only thing that comes to mind when I hear you talk about physical borders is that uh, with the Thames estuary, I was very aware of Brexit and that we had voted, that we had voted to separate ourselves from Europe. And that, be it. And that yeah. And that really one of the reasons that England has always been so well known for being so accepting is probably because of the unbelievable trade that went up and down the river. The Dutch, the Chinese, the whole world sailed up and the Dutch settled along, you know, Canvey Island was reclaimed by the Dutch um, and, and, and they settled there. The Americans traded, the Chinese traded, every nation on earth traded and also landed up living in London and beyond, which is why there's such a melting pot in this country to then be separated from Europe seemed incredible and, 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 and hugely, saddening for me. So that's the only context that I can think of photography and borders, I'm afraid. No, well, that would make sense. So because a lot of, a lot of the uh, Thames estuary are titled in what they look towards. Uh -huh. and, and, and often that was Belgium and Holland or, or, or France even. Um, you know, to be the, the the view out over the, yes, the over the water. Yes. So, <clears throat> but you know, what struck me is your portraits and your nudes are a different affair. Um, <laughs> from, your land, from your landscapes. <laughs> In your studio, lighting takes center stage, it seems to me. To very good effect, I must say. Thank you. And uh, you once responded to me on Instagram <clears throat> saying that you like studio work because of the amount of control that it affords you. And of course, you know, outdoors photography is a little different on that score. They're entirely different. In a, in, a, in, in a, in what one has to physically endure. But internally, they, they work exactly the same for me because I'm only interested in the end result. I'm not interested in, in, in the process. I'm interested in the object 
the print and how it is presented to a viewer. And with the landscape, I go to a place sometimes even without a camera and just sit there and try and absorb the atmosphere of a certain place. And then I might return with the camera or I've gone the first time and, and I photograph. It's all about atmosphere for me. And then I will take that back and print it, whether I print in a dark room or on a screen. Um, that atmosphere is, is, is uh, remembered and what I feel about that landscape, I try and um, um, bring to a final print. And that might be enhanced by a film I make or think, but it's about atmosphere. When I work with portraits, very early on, I decided that working in the way of a street portrait or in someone's home, I didn't mind it, but it felt like an unbelievably well-trodden path and one that I wanted to um, invent another way. And so I took people out of context, always on a plain background or usually on a plain background. And the only way that I could build atmosphere was obviously meeting the person and the atmosphere of a person, but but the stage that they were in, in, a, in parallel to the atmosphere that might be outdoors, I would build that in my studio. And that's usually done before a person walks in, according to their face. I would think how might this person, how might the alchemy be uh, enhanced? And I would try something and then when they occupy the space, I would adjust. And that's how I work with portraits. But the end result is always about that atmosphere and showing a human displaying some common emotion, which I loosely call human condition. When you're a does, that, does that help? Does that yes, it does. does. That sound, does that sound okay or like bullshit? No, no. Uh, I understand that. That I understand your process for photographing portraits. Um, Reminds me of Irving Penn, for instance, who took his subjects into the studio and created an atmosphere around the character. Uh, Right, right. But you know, you know, Raphael, I think the important thing, and I find it so hard to explain, that when I look at what I call a successful portrait, or I look at what I have called a successful estuary picture, it's the feeling I get is exactly the same. I don't, I don't feel like they're different. I'm sorry, this camera seems to be moving all of its own accord. It's finding movement for this guy painting outside. And it, look at that, it's amazing. Um, it, yeah, so the feeling, the feeling, and feeling is important to me because it's not about my head. I don't, I don't need to put things into words or, or, or explain them too much. For me, it's about a, a gut and a feeling in my body. And it's no different if I make an exciting portrait or an exciting work outdoors. Yes, but you know, there's something that comes up for me is that, uh, as you're speaking, is that outdoors, you're uh, interacting with something that, let's say, is bigger than you. The space, this weather, there's the light, the natural light, all of that. It's bigger than us. Is what you're getting in the studio bigger than you as well? And as how, because the, the inter, how you interact with something that's bigger than you is different than when you interact with something else. And I understand that you are still in pursuit of the same goal. I understand that but the experience must be different. The experience is different. The experience indoors feels lonelier. 
Yes, I beg your pardon. Yes, what? It feels it. The experience indoors feels lonelier. Lonelier. I feel less. I feel more. Um, I have to make the changes. Mm -hmm. I have to make not the decisions because the decisions are equal outdoors, but I have to make the changes to react to. So often I might, I might make a, I might make a change to lighting. Oh, it's hard to explain. Um, That's why I'm asking the question. It can't. I don't. I don't. You know. I. Uh, um yeah it's a very very interesting one one i haven't thought a lot about i feel like i'm in a therapy session right at this moment <laughs> <laughs> um i react to atmosphere as i've explained to you so i need to make the mistakes in the studio i can't work with a helper who can't let things flow that can't I, I i can't work with someone who needs to know exactly the percentage of the light or where it goes or the or you know and and is rigid it needs to it needs to flow so that one can react to a mistake to make some things better so that it's always in flux in the studio so I, in a way, I feel lonelier because I have to do everything. I have to keep it flowing to react to it. While outside, as you said, there's weather, there's distance, there's viewpoint. Um, um, there's more that one is given to react to. I have to provide in the studio to react to. Yes. That's probably, that's, I'm not a great speaker, but that last sentence made sense. And what is it about portraits that matters to you? Is it the challenge? Because they can be quite challenging. Um, portraits are very tricky to do. As a photographer, I know that. And I'm wondering what it is that uh, makes it so important to you and it's, makes it such an important part of your practice. Because I feel I feel like it's the close in view of what of the work I make outdoors. I feel it's almost uh, like the thumbprint, like a close in view of the human condition, um, really up up front. The sustained view. The other, the outdoor is 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 um, is much more subtle and both feel incomplete without the other. One complements the other. For me, yes. Although hard to show in one room, but I'm managing here at Howard Greenberg. In the main room, there are two portraits, um, which will be displayed with the outdoor work. And then a whole separate room of, I think, 40 portraits. And I'll be very, I'll be very interested I'll be very interested to watch viewers and to hear what people say afterwards about the um, the thread that they feel that they form and what they feel it to be. Well, after what you just said, I'm compelled to ask, have you ever tried a diptych with one portrait in one landscape? No. I would, I think that I would want to, if I did that, I think I would want to, um, well, no, no, you know, uh, um, I, I'm not sure that, I would love to work like that. I'm not sure that I wouldn't want to create things accordingly, but as my work stands right now, if I never picked up the camera again, I would really welcome a curator to, to put that together. I really do um, feel that work well curated and pictures that are put together often gain a far greater meaning than, than, than the usual 
um, groupings according to project. So going back to the thread, do you think that your body of work is executed in such a way that the possibility of combining landscapes with portraits is there for a curator to find and put together. Absolutely. The elements are already there. I think they're already there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that will be an interesting experience for you. It would be fantastic. Nothing would excite me more. I think it's the most, I think the experience, it would be one way of really adding to the experience um, for a viewer. And what is your reward in all this? And in which form is it delivered to you? What lets you know to say, yes, it was all worth it? And what are these moments like for you? As I get older, I realize that my ego and my history, um, that sort of injection in your arm, that heroin, that, that, that uh, um, accolade is very short lived. And really the only, the, only, um, the only real reason for doing this is, is, is to inspire others to, to um, look into themselves for answers, to also to challenge. I can't imagine making work in the future without um, tipping my hat to the climate catastrophe that's ahead of us, climate change to fascism, I do think that art needs to, or that art does um, um, soften or open people's minds and hearts. Um, that, that, that to me is the, is when I'm making, that to me would be the, the real deep, deep felt sense that I'm not, um, um, wasting resources, paper, uh, for nothing. Your own life, really. Yeah, my whole life, really. So that it's, you know, that it's, that it's, you know, the, the, the world at the moment is so becoming so prescriptive. Um, people are working in front of screens all the time with graphs, with, uh, it's becoming more and more mathematical and prescriptive. And I think that art is so necessary to counterbalance that. Um, to just make work that people like and buy, um, I have realized is a very short lived, uh, it's one super ego is being stroked and it's not worth a lot. What do you think, Raphael? I think that the state in which we put ourselves because we need to do it as we produce the work that we produce is the end, is what it's all about, mm -hmm. is transcending the present condition as we know it in everyday life. Um, it's yeah, almost, well, well it's put. Almost a, it's almost an out of body experience. Um, yeah, I have been I have been photographing since I was thirteen, with a little break from when I was sixteen to eighteen. And then not one day has gone by that I have not been involved in art. Um, 
and so what you say is absolutely true you know i can't imagine doing anything else it's what i need to do yes and it's more than just the intravenous that you were referring to before you know uh, well that's often the drive that's often the the drive that one feels to get that next heroin hit but you very quickly realize that um just due to how quickly it fades that it's it's not useful really yes you have to wake up from it at some point absolutely <laughs> yeah i'm gonna have to pay you for this it's like you're a, that's my therapist well i have another proposition for you later i think you're going to like it okay but in the end which aspect of your work would you prefer to be known by? Is there a consensus already forming out there that positions you this way or that within the photographic universe? When somebody says, not of Kander, does something come up in most people's mind than an image, a particular image that encapsulates to use the word no i would love i would love in later life for people to have seen my work as one body of work as one as 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 just my work um i think i think historically this idea of you know i started out making pictures just for pictures sake for 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 their not for pictures sake but for their singular power um and got moved into the idea of um um the series the project um and what i'm trying to what i'm what i what I am hinting at very strongly with the thread is that really it's what 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 has always driven it is not the subject matter but the thread that runs within me. Yes, and what does it all mean to you when you look back on your journey, and you look back on the journey on the distance covered? Uh, what do you see when you look back, and which thoughts? rise to the surface. You look back and you see everything that you've accomplished, all the places you've been to, the interaction with these people, the energy. What comes to mind? I don't think I can answer that. It's such a it's such a wide flow for me. I don't really think that I can put it into a sentence. Well, let me read the poem from William William Stafford to you. <clears throat> There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, it can't get lost. Tragedies happen. People get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. That is the poem that inspired mm -hmm. the exhibit that's right now in the gallery where you sit, and that's opening in a couple of nights. Uh, 
And that's why I chose it and that's why it's on the wall. So maybe my answer is simply that, what you've just read. Yeah. Because it feels, it feels incredibly spot on. So one last question. Will you have time before you go for one game of ping pong? <laughs> I d Where? <laughs> Where? Yeah. On 23rd Street, there's a uh, ping pong um, place called uh, Spin. Very well known. Really? Loved. Yes. <laughs> Very well known. Um, I would love, and, and do you play ping pong? Yes. Oh, right. I have, I, I have played a few games in the last 20 years, very few games. I love it, but I've lost my smash, which is, which is troubling, I must tell you. Your thunder. Yeah, I can just defend and defend and defend against somebody decent. <laughs> um, I'm going, uh, you know, my daughter is with me and it's her birthday the day after the opening. Um, I wish that I could, I know I'll have some hours free, but I don't know when. Well, you have, you, my, you have my cell number. Are you, are you nearby? Yes. You nearby the 23rd Street? Well, I'm, yeah, I get on the subway and I'm there in 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, I have, if, if I have the time, I'd love to. I've got just, quite a few. Just, things, just for but the it would be it. great. Just for the fun of it. Listen, um, thank you so, so much. And um, thank and you. I, and I'll actually see you at Howard Greenberg's gallery in a couple of days. Great. And how did you know I play ping pong? Because you, say, you said so in one of your <laughs> bios, I think. That's funny. Oh, yeah, I remember. I remember. You remember where? Yes. Yes. How often do you play? Right now, I play twice a week. Uh, and I get very sore afterwards, but I enjoy it. Uh, it's fun. And I've learned that um, you can go on YouTube and watch um, tutorials, and they're great, and you can improve that way. Great. I, yeah, that sounds great. I would love to. Um, yeah, you're inspiring me to join a club or something in England. I was. I was quite good when I was a teenager, but I was a teenager and in South Africa, and I never really improved after that. So I play a game that you can tell I used to play, but yes. I, I'm, not up, I'm not up to speed. Yes. Um, but yeah, <laughs> be great to see you on the night. Yes, yes, yes. I will, I'll see you on, the op on opening night. Great, thank you. And nice to meet you here. Same here. Take care, Nadav. And and bye. And you bye. Bye.